Inshallah, in this audio clip, we'll discuss briefly the summary of Surah Al Anfal, and then Inshallah, we'll get into the tafsir of certain ayat of the Surah. Starting off with the name Al Anfal. Al Anfal, the Arabic language, is the plural of Nafal. So, Nafal means something which is extra, something which is surplus. And its application could be uh, very broad, it could be used in many different contexts. For example, extra salat, we call it Nafal Salah. Salah, which is optional, we call it Nafal Salah. Or for example, the child or the grandchild of, we can say, of, of a sheikh camel is also called, for example, Nafal, something which is extra surplus. In the context of this surah, Nafal refers to Ghanima, refers to booty, the spoils of war. Why? Because the actual objective of engaging in warfare and striving in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is for the protection of deen, for the protection of Islam, for the protection of the lands of the Muslims. So, that is the actual objective, that is what a person is desiring to obtain. Now, on top of that, a person is able to achieve the spoils of war, booty, that is considered extra. So this is why the booty, the, the, the spoils of war is, is called nafal also in the Arabic language. Is a brief history behind the revelation of the initial ayat of Surah Al-Anfas, as narrated by Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhumah, that when the Battle of Badr took place, on the day of the Battle of Badr, Rasulullah also made a proclamation announcement that whoever kills any disbeliever, then he will get a certain amount of reward. He will get such and such, such and such. And then the Prophet ﷺ mentioned whoever captures any fighter, any warrior from the Kufar side, then he will get a certain reward. So, as the battle took place, the older Sahaba, the, the senior ones, they stayed in their post, they stayed at the rear of the flanks, they stayed behind the flags. As far as the young Sahaba, they hurried towards, you know, jumping into the enemy lines and trying to kill and trying to capture as much booty and spoils of war as they could. So when the battle was over, the older senior Sahaba said to the young ones, the youngsters, that, you know, you have to make us a partner with you in the spoils of war which you have obtained. Because it was only through our support and the defense that we provided and reinforcement that we provided behind you that you were able to obtain the spoils of war. And if anything were to happen to you while you jumped into the enemy lines straightforward and you were pushed back, then you would, have have to, you would have had to take support and reinforcement from us. So therefore, we are also deserving. So the Sahaba, the younger ones, they initially denied, they, they rejected that proposal. And there was this dispute that was brought forward to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then thereafter, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed the initial ayat of Surah Al-Anfal. Yes, al ka'an al-Anfal. They, the Sahaba, ask you about those spoils of war. Allah says, all of it belongs to Allah. And His Messenger, and then the believers. That all of it belongs to Allah and His Rasul, and they have the right to dispute it as they want. Thereafter, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he divided and he split up the booty between all of the Sahaba equally. Surah Al-Anfal is a Madani Surah. And in this Surah, the exclusive or very specific subject matter that is discussed more intensely and more in depth with more detail as compared to the rest of the Surahs in the Quran is with regards to the campaigns and fighting the disbelievers striving in the path of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And the legislative commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are in relation to striving in the path of Allah, that are in relation to warfare, that are in relation to fighting. So these commands were revealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after the battle of Badr, which inshallah I will discuss briefly shortly after this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He in the surah informs the believers how they should carry out warfare and how what kind of a we can say foreign policy the believers should have with foreign uh, states that are outside of Medina al Munawwara, whether it is a situation of war, whether it's it's a period of war, whether it's a period of peace and mutual uh, harmony. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also discusses the ahkam and the rulings related to captives and also like we mentioned, the rulings related to ghanima and booty, spoils of war. So the surah was revealed after the battle, after the campaign of Badr. And like we know, Badr happened in the second year after Hijrah and it was the first of the open and uh, we can say direct battles with the mushrikeen, uh, with the disbelievers, the kuffar, that the Muslims engaged in after the initial Islamic State was established in Madid al-Munawwara. And in this battle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also calls it, for example, Yawm al-Furqan, the, dis uh, the day of distinguishing, the day of separating between truth and falsehood. So this, in this battle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed from this point on how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was going to openly help his army, the army of his believers. Uh, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would continue to help the believers from this point on moving forward all the way until the end of the end of times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
describes in the surah how the believers should be in warfare, in battle, in terms of their, their bravery, in terms of their courage, in terms of being just, uh, in terms of being perseverant, being prudent, being steadfast, being firm, all of these different things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about. So like we were mentioning, the Ghazwa of Badr happened in the month of Ramadan in the second year after Hijrah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to make this Ghazwa, this battle, the first of skirmishes between truth and falsehood. And after this, obviously, many skirmishes would take place in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would assist the believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this the first confrontation in which he would repel rebellion, which he would repel transgression and oppression. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used this battle, Ghazwatul Badr, Ghazwatul Badr, to save the mustadafin, the Muslim men, men and women and children that were considered weak and that were oppressed and that were against their will kept hostage or kept as captives in Mecca al Mukarramah and prevented from migrating and making hijrah towards Medinatul Munawwara. So because they did not have family members who were Muslim to support them, they were not people of prominent status in society, so therefore there was all kinds of oppression against them. They were tortured and they were against their will kept back in Mecca al Mukarramah. So these people, these Muslims in Mecca al Mukarramah, they would uh, humble themselves and they would uh, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they would beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could take them out of this settlement of Makkah al-Makarramah in which the people were oppressive. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered their plea, their call, their begging in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah prepared the setting and the scene of this ghazwa. And while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped the believers, despite the fact that the odds were against them, despite the fact that their numbers were little, they were only, the, the Muslims were only about 313 like we hear in, this, in the seerah, and the disbelievers being up to a thousand, equipped with uh, all kinds of weapon and armor and modes of transportation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made this means where so many of the major chieftains and the leaders of the Quraysh of Mecca, who were disbelievers, were, were killed in this battle. And it gave an opportunity for the weak Muslims to now migrate to Medinat al because the oppression was not as strong against them. And this battle being so unique, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped the Muslims against, so, against the odds that were against, uh, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped the Muslims despite the odds that were against them. Like we mentioned, the fact that they were so small in number, and also the fact that they were barely equipped. They only had about eight swords. They had very little number of horses and camels, and they really were not in a position to engage in, in any kind of a fight. But despite the fact, despite that fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assisted them, and Allah sent the angels, like Allah mentioned in the Quran, this became an opportunity that for people to recognize all over the Arabian Peninsula and surrounding areas of Mecca al and Medina al and the Arabian Peninsula, people, the Arabs were able to recognize that now the Muslims, they are a special group of people, that they have divine assistance on their side, and that they... They truly, they truly are on the haq. They truly are on the truth, the deen of truth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also made it clear uh, in this battle that this, no matter how strong and how numerous the forces of falsehood may be and how long their reign may be and how well they may be in terms of having resources, how well off they may be and how much control and power and influence they might have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it very clear in this battle that till the end of time, falsehood will always have to fall in front of the truth. Uh, falsehood will always have to fall in front, of the, in front of the truth, kufr. Well, disbelief will always have to uh, subject itself in front of iman, in front of belief. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this very clear. He, he made this manifest in the battle of Badr. In this, in this surah, uh, while Allah azza wa jal talks about uh, the ghazwa of Badr in surah al-anfal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he makes four, we can say, announcements and calls to the believer and turns their attention towards certain qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes that they adopt within themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them guidances. While this, in, in the midst of this, in the midst of narrating this whole ghazwa, the campaign of Badr. And all of these, in all of these calls, in all of these proclamations, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the, addresses the Muslims as, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, all those who have iman. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, all those who have iman. So this serves as a purpose to remind them that whatever qualities Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is demanding them to adopt and to adorn themselves with, these are all the dictates and the demands of having iman, of being believers. Ya amanu. That is because of the fact that you're believers that you should also have all of these qualities which I am directing you towards, which I am, which I am guiding you with. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in making this call and announcement by uh, calling the believers as ya ladina, with ya ladina amanu, that all, all those who have iman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also is trying to uh, make note of the fact that the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which the believers will collect for themselves, that divine help of Allah will only be 
by means of primarily this iman, and not by means of any other material means, whether weapons or the forces and the numbers of men. So as far as the first call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in it, He warns the believers from running away from the battlefield. That, Ya ayuhal ladheena amanu, idha laqeetum al ladheena kafaru zahfan, fala tuwalluhum al adbar. That, O oh, believers, when you meet the disbelievers on the battlefield, and you are marching slowly towards them, then do not turn your back towards them and run away and flee from the battlefield. Then this Allah, in these ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns those that are suffering defeat in the battlefield, that in front of the enemies, they should not turn their back. Because it is not that they're only turning their back to save their own lives, but they are turning their back to the force of Iman, the force of Haq, truth, in, in this battlefield. They're not just representing their own personal selves, they're representing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this battlefield. They're representing Islam. In the second call, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he directs the believers towards listening and obeying to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the command of His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah mentions, Ya ayuhal ladheena amanu, atayu Allahu wa rasoolahu wa la tawallu anhu wa antum tasma'oon. That all believers, obey Allah and His Messenger and do not turn away from them while you are listening. And you know exactly what the command is. You know exactly what you are being demanded from Allah and His Messenger. What is being demanded from you. Uh, do not turn your back. So, in this specifically, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns <coughs> the attention of the believers towards obedience and towards, towards obedience of Allah and His Rasul Messenger. Because without obedience of Allah and His Messenger, just being called a Muslim, just being in the enemy, just being in the Muslim ranks, this will not be enough to get the divine help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, making this fact very clear, this point very clear, that no matter how, how, re how, resource, how, how, how many resources a believer, a Muslim might have in terms of weapons and numbers and in terms of all kinds of uh, preparations that he might have made to be successful in the battlefield, if obedience of Allah and his messenger is not there, then despite all of this, Despite this setting which is created, which, which, which makes it look like a person will not suffer defeat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a person suffer losses. Like it happened in, for example, in the battle of Uhud. Like it happened initially in the battle of Hunayn. As far as the third, the third call that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Ya ayuhal ladheena amanu, istajibu lillahi wa lirrasul idha da'akum lima yuhikum. That all believers, respond to the call of Allah and His Messenger when they call you towards that which gives you life. Inshallah, this we'll discuss, I will discuss this inshallah in the tafsir of certain ayat that I want to discuss. This is, this is one of the ayat that I, was, I would like to discuss later inshallah. The fourth call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes, to the believers, and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits the believers from in this fourth call is committing treason and treachery against Allah and His Messenger. Allah says, Ya ayuhal ladheena amanu la takhunu Allah wa rasul wa takhunu amanatikum wa antum ta'lamun. That all believers, do not commit treason against Allah and His Messenger, and do not breach the trust of, in the trust that have been given to you while you have knowledge of the fact that you are that you're committing treason or that you're committing treachery. So in this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He uh, brings to the attention of the believers that exposing the secrets of the ummah of the nation of the Muslims to the enemy, this is one of the biggest crimes, this is treachery, and this is treason against Allah and His Messenger. And like we know, in most countries in the world, the, the punishment for committing treason is usually capital capital punishment, it's usually punishable by death in most countries in the world, is when you expose the secrets of the government, of, this, of, the, uh, of the country that you are a citizen in, and you expose that to other, other governments, other countries, so that they can take advantage and harm the government that you, uh, the country that you're living in. This is committed, this is treason. And this is usually punishable by death. Allah mentions that exposing the secrets of the ummah, the weaknesses of the ummah, so that the disbelievers, so that the disbelievers can take advantage and the disbelievers, the kuffar, can harm the Muslims. Allah says, this is such a great crime. Do not do such a thing. So there is a certain, there are certain incidents that took place, especially in the Battle of Badr. Uh, with the Sahabi Hatib bin Abi Balta radiallahu anhu, he committed a mistake. Uh, we're not going to get into the story in detail, but he committed a mistake that he had family in. Um, actually, this happened, sorry, not in, in the Battle of Badr, but this happened in the conquest of Makkah in the eighth year after Hijrah, when Makkah was conquered by the Muslims. Hatib bin Abi Balta sent a messenger, a woman, to Makkah to inform his family that the Muslims were coming and just to protect themselves so that they don't and they don't get harmed when the Muslims come and take over. He did not. The only reason he did this was because his family in Makkah had no one to protect them and look after them. So he did this not to harm the Muslims, he did this not to harm, you know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not to harm Medina, but he did this only to protect his own family. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he uh, informed the ummah with regards to this. This is mentioned in certain other ayat. The fifth call that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes is, is the call towards taqwa. That Allah says, Ya ayuhal ladheena amanu, in tattaqullah yaj'al lakum furqan wa yukafir ankum sayyatikum wa yaghfir lakum allahu dhal fadlil azim. Allah says, Allah turns the attention, the gaze of the Muslims towards taqwa, that... Taqwa is the root and the essence of all good. Taqwa is the foundation of all good. And the greatest of the benefits and the fruits of taqwa is uh, the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which He will put in the heart of the Muslims. And this light 
is what will enable a person, a Muslim, to differentiate which, between false, between right and between wrong, between the truth and between falsehood, between guidance and misguidance. And this is, if you fear Allah, have consciousness of Allah, then Allah will make a criterion for you which will distinguish for you what is right and wrong. And Allah will expiate your sins and Allah will forgive you. And Allah is, uh, Allah is the possessor of the greatest of virtue and bounty. The last call that Allah makes is for the Muslims to remain steadfast and firm in the battlefield. Allah says, When you meet a group in the battlefield, O believers, فَثْبُتُوا Remain steadfast and firm. وَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا And remember Allah abundantly so that you may be successful. So two things Allah mentions in this is, number one, to be steadfast and firm in front of the enemies. Uh, when, 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 initial contact and, uh, when initial conflict takes place. And to remember and have the presence of the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one's mind. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is, when His help is there, and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to assist, then there is no one that can overpower that and overturn that. So Allah mentions in this ayah that to get the divine help from Allah, the spiritual help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is by means of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly. This, will, this, is, this is what will make a person steadfast in the battlefield, even though the odds are against the Muslim. Even though the setting and the circumstances some, is, is such that is not favorable to the Muslims, Allah says the way which will, which will assist you, divine, which will get you divine assistance from Allah is to remember Allah is to have the presence of Allah, that Allah is watching over this. Allah is control of everything. Allah is control over the battlefield. Allah is control over the positions of the battlefield, the outcome of the, of, of the war and the strategies and everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finish at the end of the day. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one that makes decisions. And it's only His decision uh, according to which everything will play out. So this remembrance of Allah, dhikr of Allah, is which will give a person, the believer, Allah says, uh, peace of mind and conviction and firmness in the battlefield himself. And this is what will be able to get him the divine help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by means of the angels and by means of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's other many, many forces and enemies helping the Muslims in, the, in, these, in these battles. So certain ayat I want to discuss, starting with the second ayah in Surah Al-Anfal. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرُ اللَّهُ وَجِدَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتٌ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانٌ وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ حَقَّ لَهُمْ دَرَجَاتٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ وَمَغْفِرَةٌ وَرِزْقٌ كَرِيمٌ Allah says the complete and true complete believers are only those who when Allah is mentioned Allah's name is mentioned in their presence then their hearts tremble out of fear and out of awe and out of greatness and out of the out of the greatness and majesty for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when his ayat the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are recited to them, Zadatum imana. It increases their belief. It strengthens their belief. It enlightens their belief and iman in Allah and His signs and the message of Rasulullah s.a.w. even more. And only upon their Rabb, only upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do they rely and have trust in. Allah says, they are also those who, they are also those who establish salah. They are also those who establish salah. And they spend from that which we have provided them. Allah says, these are the believers who are the true believers. They will have very high uh, ranks and stages in Jannah for them by their Rabb. For, so by their Rabb, by their Lord, they have Allah SWT has prepared for them very high ranks, stages. And forgiveness and an honorable sustenance and provision. So a couple of things about these ayat. Is, number one, Allah SWT talks about the qualities the qualities of the perfect believers. The people that are perfect in their believers, the people that have complete sincerity in their belief are those that have certain of these certain qualities. So number one is the the the, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this fear is not a fear which causes uh, panic or which causes unease, which causes discomfort, but rather this is a, a fear which is which is uh, we can we can actually translate it as awe. We can we uh, this is a fear which is actually combined with tranquility and peace and being at ease. So in other ayat of the Quran, Allah mentions, for example, وَبَشِّرِ الْمُخْبِتِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا وَبَشِّرِ الْمُخْبِتِينَ uh, Okay, I'm forgetting that ayah. But in another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, for example, أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُ الْقُلُوبِ That listen very well. Only by the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do, do the hearts find peace and tranquility. So this this fear here, this trembling that the hearts have, وَجِدَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ is out of the greatness and awe and majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah is so great. So this is the first quality. So we need to see if we have this in our hearts. That how much do our hearts take effect when we hear about Allah, when we hear the name of Allah. Secondly, Allah mentions that the complete believers, they have this quality that when the ayat of Allah recited to them, when the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recited to them, that look, Allah, Allah talks about the skies, the earth, the moon, the stars. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talks about His signs in human beings themselves. That look at your skin colors, look at the different languages, look at the love that Allah placed between the spouses, look at the rings that Allah brings, look at all these signs. 
And there's a way that tuliyat alayhi ma yatu in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa talks about his signs to show his power, to show his qudra, to show his oneness, to show that he's in charge. This increases their belief, zadatum imana, their, their belief becomes even more strong, their conviction becomes even more strong. Right? So this, how much, how much do our hearts, how much of our iman gets, uh, gets affected when we hear the signs of Allah subhanahu wa All of the ayat which indicate to the power of Allah, to the oneness of Allah. So that's the second thing. And one, one way to know uh, how our iman is being increased is the fact that when the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are recited, how much does it affect us in a way where we are, where we are more connected to a'mal salihah where we have a greater love and passion for doing those actions which will please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which brings us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ulama mentioned that this is a fact, that one way to, one way to actually see the, the, the iman of a person being strengthened, exemplified, is the fact that when a person, he works on his iman and a person, he reflects over the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he becomes even, uh, even more involved with amal salihah, he becomes even more used to it, to the fact that uh, it, it hurts him, it pains him when he's not able to perform a good deed, uh, when he's not able to perform an obligation, a command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a person, he were, his iman becomes so strong to the point where uh, it, it, it grieves him just as much when a person accidentally commits a sin, for example, that it, make, it hurts him. And he, a person's nature is so averted from committing these sins that naturally a person, he feels very disgusted that even when he, feels, when he accidentally commits these sins. This is, like, this is the next quality. The, the next quality Allah mentioned about the perfect believers, Allah says, Allah says, Allah says, Allah that only on their Rabb do they rely, only trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do not fear anyone besides Him, and they do not have hope in anyone besides Him. They do not have hope in anyone besides Him, and they don't fear anyone besides Him. So that doesn't mean that they don't take their precautions in this world, that they don't scheme and plan, and they don't use the means available to fulfill their necessities in this world. No, all of this is there, this is also sunnah. But after preparing and planning and using the resources uh, and the means available, the trust is only in Allah, that only Allah, their, their minds and hearts, only have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's, uh, uh, only have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power. And his doing uh, embedded within them, and they don't they don't have any any hope any any uh, reliance on anything besides Allah. Thereafter, Allah mentions, "Alladhin salah those who establish salah, meaning that they perform salah with all of its rights and requisites and etiquettes in the complete in the most complete way, internally, externally, with all of with the concentration, devotion, and all the postures being according to sunnah, with the recitation being with the tajweed, everything, all the aspects of salah are complete. Those who establish salah, this is part of this is part of the signs of." of those that have complete belief. And thereafter, وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ This is, and from what we have granted them, they spend. They spend in the path of Allah. This includes everything that is spent to please Allah subhanahu wa in the path of Allah, whether it is optional or whether it is obligatory. Whether it's zakah, whether it's sadaqah, optional charity, whether it's to entertain the guest, whether it's spending on their own family, whatever it is, all of it with the intention to please Allah, they spend from that which you have given them in avenues to please Allah subhanahu wa Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ حَقَّ these are, the, these are the complete believers, the true complete believers, هُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ حَقَّ وَلَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ حَقَّ The people that have all of these qualities, the people that, that have adopted and they possess all of these qualities, these are the true believers, Allah says, because they've combined between iman and they've combined between good actions. And ulama also mentioned that these, are, these actions are such that even though all of deen is not encompassed within these actions, for example, hajj is not mentioned, fasting is not mentioned, for example, fulfilling the rights of a person's wife is not mentioned, for example, uh, so many different commands of Allah subhanahu wa are not mentioned. But because of the fact that these are such strong pillars in a person's religion, in a person's Islam, that it will give birth and rise to all the remaining aspects and qualities and injunctions uh, uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says the reward for these people, the compensation for these people will be what? لَهُمْ دَرَجَاتٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ They will have lofty high stages by their Lord in Jannah. لَهُمْ دَرَجَاتٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ So, as the Prophet have mentioned in their tafsir, that this, this, this reward will be uh, in return for having that such belief that their hearts tremble when they hear Allah's name. So for that trembling, for that kind of iman, they will have the highest of, j of stages. <clears throat> then, وَمَغْفِرَةٌ They will have forgiveness. And this forgiveness will be from the fact, will be, will be as, as a reward, will be as compensation for the fact that they have trust. We can say that um, they have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only. That وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّرُونَ So Allah says, they will have forgiveness. They will, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive their sins. And lastly, what is Qun Karim? That they will have, as a reward, they will have an honorable sustenance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not that they're just, you know, given food and drink, but they will be given to it in a way that they're honored, that they're shown that they're dignified people in Jannah, that, that it will make them look like they're even more important by giving them the sustenance. It will be given with them with honor. So this will be, as a reward, 
in return for for them spending in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thereafter, I want to mention a couple other ayat. The next ayah I want to mention is in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Ya'ahu al amanu, istajibu lillahi wa lirasooli idha da'akum lima yuh, idha da'akum lima yuhikum. That all those who have iman respond to the call of Allah and His Messenger when they call you towards that which gives you life. Subhanallah. So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He addresses the command of obedience and respond to Allah and His Rasul in a very unique and beautiful way. That respond to that which is beneficial for you. Respond to that which will give life to you. Subhanallah, Allah says life. Allah says it will give life to you. How will it give life to you? So in with this regard, many different opinions Mufassirun have mentioned. So one is, what will give you life is Iman. Because it's with Iman that the hearts have life. And it's, it's kufr, disbelief, that the hearts they die. Because a person that doesn't have Iman and a person has kufr, is like a person who's, who's a dead person. And like it comes in the hadith that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi himself, Nabi Sallallahu compared, the person who remembers Allah is like a person who's living, and the person who doesn't remember Allah is a person who's dead. Even though he's walking, talking, breathing, he has a family, he's fulfilling his needs and chores and all that stuff, but spiritually completely dead. So it's like any other uh, of the creation that are just, you know, roaming about living their lives without any purpose. So Allah says, uh, respond to the call of Allah which gives you, which gives you life. So one opinion of what, what that is which gives life is Iman. Another is Quran. Another is following the truth. So all of these things, having Iman, we can combine them all together. Having Iman, uh, holding on to the Quran, abiding by the injunction of the Quran, uh, following the truth, following the message of Deen, following the message of Rasulullah Wasallam and all the Prophets. This is that which gives the souls, which gives the, the hearts life. And so, and in without connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be distanced from Allah, to be veiled from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the things which make a person ghafil and negligent, and by the shahawat and the desires, the carnal based desires of the nafs, this is when a person he he is no longer living. So subhanAllah, so many people they commit suicide. Why do they commit suicide? They don't have peace in their hearts. Why don't they have peace in their hearts? Is because they're attached to everything besides Allah and His Messenger. They're attached to everything besides Allah. To attach a person's self with to creation, to materialistic things. It causes grief, it causes depression, it causes all kinds of anguish, it causes worry and sorrow, it causes uh, depression and tension. So Allah says, for you to be living life, for you to, in, to for you to enjoy your experiences and your interactions with the world around you, it requires that you first are connected to the creator of the things of the of, uh, of the things around you, of the things that are created around you. If you are connected to the creator of, uh, if you are connected to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, being the creator of the things around you, then that is what will give you life and enable you to enjoy the experiences that you have with everything around you. So Allah says, respond to Allah and His Messenger. Uh, when they call you to that which gives you life, and it is the iman, the Quran, which they call you towards. It is following the truth, the message of the prophets that they give you, that they call you towards. That is what will give you life, right? not not the the physical life, the food and drink and water. That that can be there, but even despite having that, a person can be dead because his heart is dead. Subhanallah. Allah says, this is what gives you life. Allah didn't mention food and water and drink. Thereafter, Allah says, that know very well that Allah comes between man and his heart. And that you will be resurrected unto him. What does it mean that Allah becomes comes in between man and his heart? So ulama give two, two meanings here. One is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has complete control of the heart, even more so than the man himself. So this this signifies that when a person has intention to do something good, Allah says hasten to do it. Before the, the intention in the heart change, because Allah controls the hearts. Allah can flip the conditions in the heart in a in a heartbeat, in an instant. And the intentions he had to do good completely are vanished in, in a second, split second. So when a person has the intention to do good, do it right away. Allah says, Allah has control. You don't have control over the heart. Don't think that you'll be able to do it later. You don't know how long that intention is going to last, how long that desire to do good is going to last. And also, a person has the strength to do, uh, has, has a, is, is, dis is, is disgusted, for example, from doing an evil sin, uh, that the idea of which shaitan has put in his mind, for example. So act on that right away and distance yourself right away. Don't delay and ponder and let it linger around because you don't know what's going to happen to your heart. All of a sudden, later, a split second later, the heart is now inclined. Allah says, distance yourself right away. That good... That good feeling that you have of wanting to distance yourself, act upon it right away because you don't have control. That's one meaning. Also, Allah in this in this meaning also is included the fact that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He He controls the hearts in such a way that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He can, or not not only that Allah Subhanahu wa controls the hearts, but Allah Subhanahu wa Taala controls the outside circumstances of a human being. That although a person can intend to do something and have firm resolve to do it and has made all the planning and feels that nothing can stop him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can cancel his, pl his plans and, 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 and uh, annul and nullify his, all of his firm resolved uh, you know, intentions. So even though a person feels that his heart is there and if he has the intentions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to show that Allah, is complete, Allah has complete dominance and power. At the end of the day, only, only that what Allah wants will happen. The second meaning of this ayah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the closest to a man. Closer, than, closer to a man than even his own heart. So then this this is 
talked about in another ayah in which Allah Subhanahu wa mentions aqrabu ilayhi min hablil warid huwa aqrabu ilayhi min hablil warid Allah is closer to a man than his own jugular vein Thereafter Allah Subhanahu wa mentions wa taqu fitnatan la tusibanna alladhina zalamu minkum khassa wa alamu anna Allah shadid al iqab that fear and beware of that trial and affliction and punishment which will not only afflict the wrongdoers and the oppressors, the sinners specifically, exclusively, but it will afflict everybody. What is this, what is this verse talking about? Allah SWT is warning the believers that fear the control and the seizing and the avenging of Allah SWT if you disobey His order in such a way that when there are wrongdoers, when there are sinners in the community and the, 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 the people that are righteous and virtuous, and upright and not committing those sins, they have the power to stop these sinners, and despite having the power to stop them, they do not stop them. Allah says, beware of the punishment of Allah, which will not afflict the wrongdoers only, it will afflict everybody. When the righteous people, they have the ability to stop the wrongdoers, and despite that fact, they don't stop them. Allah SWT says that the, it will, this punishment will, cover, will encompass and will surround and will afflict everybody. This is a hadith. This comes in the hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In the Nasi Dara'u Adhalim, when people when people see an oppressor or wrongdoer, Falami Akhudu Alaihi, they don't stop him. They don't hold his hands. They don't stop him. Aw shaka ayya ummahum Allahu bi adabi min indi. It's very close that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, cover them all, give a broad, wide punishment which will encompass everybody from himself. So this is such an important thereafter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions wa alamu and Allah shadidu liqa know very well that Allah is the most severe in punishment. So this is such an important in all times, in all places, that we make an effort to eradicate sin, to eradicate un- injustice and oppression and disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is through the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the barakat, the uh, the blessings of the sky and the and the lands are uplifted from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes so many different uh, dunya problems for us because of these sins. Forget about the akhirah that's, that's that's there in its place, but in this world, you know, um, relationships are ruined and all kinds of corruption, all kinds of harm and, and crime uh, come within societies where no one's life is, is, is safe, no one's wealth is safe, no one's honor is safe, uh, no, no one's family is safe, uh, no one's possessions are safe. Nothing in this world is safe in a person. And there's, uh, he's, he's in danger and threat all the time when these sins are committed. So Allah says, for the peace and harmony of your life in this world and the hereafter, you make sure that you abstain from these sins, have taqwa fear of Allah, and try to make sure that the community at large are such that they're obedient uh, and subservient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah give us tawfiq to understand and practice. Wa akhiru da'wan alhamdulillahi wa